Hello and welcome back to XCOM 2 Long War of the Chosen. My name is Saiken and we're playing the legendary Iron Man version of uh, this mod. It's better one. It is month number six and we are on the brink of liberating two additional uh, areas. Matter of fact, we are on the brink of liberating the entirety of Africa, our starting continent. Today is go time and I am looking forward for Operation Hammer Queen, a 200% infiltrated absolutely best of the best SWAT, uh, Jordan, Fury, uh, Templar, uh, Dark Tower Technician, John Sierkim Ranger, Diva Sharpshooter and Edgallion Poe Specialist type of uh, banger where we're fighting against 16 to 18 um, enemies so current enemy baseline is based on 200% infiltration. I'm not even sure if we can further boost the infiltration I don't think so. 200 is the absolute maximum. Basically reducing the baseline to where it is. Um, and as a reward, we would get uh, the location of the Advent Regional HQ plus Intel. So let's jump directly into it. And we have just landed. Our task is fairly simple. We gotta hack the network array. And we gotta do that without dying. There will be a lot of reinforcements coming in, so once we're discovered, things are gonna look pretty, pretty dire. And I'm thinking about, like this here is, this looks like a landed kind of aircraft. Over here, this time we do not have any form of cover like no this could have been a building but it isn't so we might need to make our way uh, through this without oh wait a second this is a building and building means high ground and high ground is good if you've learned anything on this channel go for the high ground Currently, we do not have any time restriction. Divot moves in here. Got it covered. Fury moves up. Oh, uh, and that guy in pole. Last but most certainly not least. By the way, we got. The nice incoming ability uh, for him, basically reducing the damage that we're taking. I should skill that more often, to be honest. Um, I mean, the get some ability is great, but incoming A doesn't cost a turn, and B, I mean, look at that. Everyone within command range, mind you, this is a, sh a immense area, so like all the way up to here. Everyone, okay, everyone gains four points of damage resistance against explosive attacks throughout the end of the next alien's turn. Think about that for a second. That means all of the mechs that have been terrorizing us are, yeah, no longer a big thing. And it seems to be reusable. Damn. I probably should skill that really more often. Well, that's the beauty of playing it. You always, whilst playing through it, you always kind of learn something new. And even though I know XCOM 2 very, very, very well, uh, the whole long war genre, I mean, I played it occasionally. I wouldn't call myself a hardcore long war fan. So, yeah, experimenting a bit with the builds is certainly something that we can do. Specifically now on the lower level um, uh, uh, teams, I think we're going to just, yeah, experiment. Agreed. Fur Fury moves up. He has Bladestorm, which is good. Let's position ourselves over here. On it. And here. Moving 
Divad theoretically could do this here, and he will next turn. Not yet. Yeah, I like how the team is starting to develop. Just if I see the extra abilities, for instance, that Edgar and Poe has super broad uh, band of skills that he can bring to the table. Flexibility is, has always been the key to XCOM. Many people underestimate that, but you really shouldn't. And that pack here, we can definitely take it. Just need to let them come a little bit closer so we're not accidentally triggering a second pack. Because I would want Fury to charge in and kill one of them. Alright, moving over here. We know the building itself is empty, and that's great information. Because it also means we can... Now there's only one cover spot up here. Hmm. But there's some full cover back here. I would rather put Sirkim in half cover, but into a better uh, shooting position than putting him into full cover and not a good shooting position. Can still use the grappling. Ah, we can't use it next turn. Thank you for the grappling hook. Just so, so damn good. And Edgar Alien Paul. This here is a really good position. Just out of curiosity. Not a good chance to control and or take over the enemy. Steadying the weapon, next turn will be a kill zone pull. Kill zone blade storm pull is the idea, which is going to be hilarious. If I can pull it off, if I come a little bit closer, I will show you like a hilarious version of, of a first round pull. <laughs> That's, that, that should be a YouTube reel or a GIF. Here's something to learn. Alright, so just two classes will potentially eliminate most of the enemies. We're not afraid about the purifier because the purifier essentially does nothing. So what we're going to do is look at this. Kill zone. And yes, please. Good. And we do have Blade Storm, so we can simply, with a single move, move up to here. We're still having our normal attack afterwards. This will detect us. And I'm even okay pulling a second pack. Like the first pack essentially is dead. Good. They now realize, oh shit, what is happening? Let's get out of here. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I don't know about you guys, but I find it incredibly satisfying. It might not be everyone's humor, but just the way that played out. Delicious. I like it. And mind you, we've used like one and a half actions for it. Kill zone is, by the way, still going. But when he continues to move, he will still be in kill zone. So we're simply going to go here because that will be adjacent to him, which means blade storm is also going. And you know, just for good measure. Taking the full cover spots. Overwatch. Uh, by the way, might as well. Before we forget about it. Throw this down. And we're all watching. I'm on it. Yeah, so he will trigger four overwatches and a blade storm. The only negative part about it is blade storm attacks unfortunately don't trigger um uh, don't give you focus, which I think is bullshit, but yeah, whatever. It's probably strong enough as it is. Okay, hilarious first pack. Layering abilities that are very strong on top of one another to make them even more bong bongus. Of course. To balance that a bit, the game is now giving us a bit more challenging encounter. It's a little bit the middle finger, the principle of the middle finger. You screwed us once, so now the game is screwing with you. Can't really go anywhere and that is a bit disheartening. Good, so let's do the obvious stuff, right? We're going into full cover. Taking a couple of flanking positions, this uh, Naga here, for instance, ba bam. Interestingly enough, they still evade even, even in these situations. So I, like I said, I'd rather take half cover, but a very short fortification, which makes it full cover, and this should be a kill. Enemy eliminated. Good job, Zirkim. So two troopers. Let's go with this one here. Happy now. We're setting the weapon.
And let's give Yuri an 8 protocol. Because he's going to be frontlining this. Now we're waiting with teamwork. I'd rather give him command because we're at the end of our turn anyways. This here would be like we had 16 to 18 baseline. Probably a bit too aggressive if we were to go all the way in. Let's see if we can soften up the snake a little bit. The answer is no. Cover is still strong. But I think this is still doable. We've probably moved a bit further to the left here, like right to here. So we do have, we do have uh, Blade Storm. Ooh, wow. Well, that's the worst case scenario right there. Which means we're going to prepare for that worst case scenario and go into full cover slash half cover. We cannot be flanked at that position. But we're going to take a lot of shots. Luckily we got a protocol and many protection, uh, many layers of protection. So from all the, uh, from all the potential soldiers that would be uh, would have that problem he's uh, the one with the highest survival chance i actually don't think that that's going to be an issue like i said this here is full cover not an issue this is even full cover plus a protocol Again, full cover plus eight protocol. They come for me. And mind you, this is indestructible, indestructible cover on top of it, so it's pretty good. This might be Blade Storm. Yep. He can still be stunned, theoretically. And we couldn't do much about it. But the stunner has missed. Me. Good. So I think it's fair to say we're having the entire. Uh, we're having pulled the entire pack. Let's get rid of the Grenadier first. There you go. Time for a solid reload. Ready to engage. Zirkim begins to give him fire cover. That's good.
So in terms of rockets, let's talk about that for a second. This here might just be the right time to do it. Taking off all of the good old overwatches. Zirka moves into full cover. Fortunately, just a tiny bit too far away so he can't see anyone. I like the idea of changing uh, the sides a bit. Let me do the following. That'll be only one overwatch shot and I think we're sprinting so it should have severe disadvantages. No, not even that. There's more focus. And let me just move to here, out of line of sight, which means they either follow him, which is fine, I don't mind that, or they're coming in our direction, which is fine as well. They don't have any explosives, so I'm not afraid about that. Gale and Poe might just stay here. It's not a bad thing. We're just waiting with teamwork. Can use that next turn. We could also slowly and have move Edgar Alien over here and begin to push because he needs to be the one making the push, right? Right. All right, moving over here into cover. Might as well fortify for now. And Overwatch, that's full cover for him. Dark Tower, full cover. He's actually standing here. And Zirkim is also in full cover. So I feel pretty good. In terms of where we are, got three Overwatches going. The enemies aren't particularly strong and we haven't even taken damage yet. 16 enemies, four in the first pack. Seven in the next pull, and then we added three, so that's 14. Might be one more pack afterwards. Oh, really? That was a pretty damn good move. They're all over me. That was a pretty damn good move. This is Firebrand. It's time to go. Okay, 
pretty decent chances all around. Zirkim takes a shot. We're reloading. And I mean this one here should be pretty pretty straightforward a kill. That's removing the overwatch. Which means Fury can go in and finish him. Pretty much a slaughter fest so far. I totally like his salvo ability. For instance, just flashbanging this guy. And still having a turn. That feels unfair. Fury is out for blood, and I know exactly how we can finish this pack. Moving on, giving him teamwork. The flashbang was simply to prevent the Overwatch from hitting. If we flawless this mission, we can reuse the soldiers right away. Lovely. And we're going to parry, which means this guy is going to shoot us. And just in case, since it's a grenadier, might as well use the incoming ability. It's a rocketeer, so why not? And we're overwatching. Dark Tower Noxus overwatches as well. This is pretty much a stomp so far. Their gods have abandoned them. More of them coming in. All right, reinforcements are coming. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. Yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. At this point, I feel pretty good about the situation. Specifically about someone taking position up here. Okay. You know, it's one of these days where you don't really know where the uh, reinforcements are going to come from, right? But you somewhat got a feeling that with this death zone, you're gonna be alright. 
going to move out of line of sight and whoever is walking into this death trap I would want to be in their shoes. Sirkem begins to move up. Edgar Alien Poe moves up here. On your order. And Dakta Noxus. Let's just park him here for now. Good. I hope that the reinforcements are dropping somewhere here. Yeah, I think they dropped right in the center of uh, the death zone. Kill zone. Yeah, pretty much. Unfortunately, the closest targets always take the first shots, which is in so far unfortunate as in this case, the sniper could have taken shots on every single one and then they, the others could have taken the overworld shots, but whatever. We killed the entire reinforcement pack. <laughs> yeah. That little bit of poison doesn't mean anything. It's a decent position that he has chosen here. But I think this here will give us loot. And very soon run and gun. So that's the Illyrium ability. 100% shot. Alternatively shotgun shot. You know what? We're saving the shotgun just in case we're standing next to someone where we need to deal a lot of damage. And that's a kill for replaceable. Moving us just into full cover. Great. Just out of curiosity. Is he seeing the mutant? No, not really, right? Otherwise we would have a shot on him. Hmm, strange. Maybe he's still seeing uh, the mutant. I'm not 100% sure. Locked and loaded. Let's try this here. The enemy should fear us. Because if he's seeing the mutant, we can and should very much kill it, but if it's... well, I mean... I guess that is better than nothing.
divert is sort of moving down here. Can always grapple back up. And we're setting the weapon. Let's give Fury here an aid protocol. And we're giving Sirkim another shot. Just in case, because he has such good aim and is a deadly force to be reckoned with. Might as well take advantage of that. I hope it's worth it. We're completely steamrolling this so far. That's the last pack and we have like absolutely demolished them. I would reload here for free. And just try to take as, uh, deal as much damage to the Sidewinder as possible. Alright, fair enough. We are going to parry. We're going to be hit in maximum by one shot. Uh, that's the first damage that we're taking. Disappointed in in that. All right, Gremlin heal. We were so close to a flawless mission. Let's start with our sniper again. 70% chance to hit the Viper. Nice little shot, good job. Um, we're going over here and see the one thing that I like about the Templar if you play him more often is you kind of get the hang of its versatility in this case did you remember how I was talking about like the double barreled shotgun Something big like standing next to us. I feel this is one of those moments. <laughs> yeah, implacable. I, I don't think that we're going to need implacable. Overwatch. Dark Clown Oxus Overwatches. And we're pretty much done for this round. The aliens have brought friends. Instead of Moving our hacker all the way up to here, which is hacking it ourselves. That's the target. Target in range. Move to hack the command console. And we are reloading, plus we're jamming, so that the reinforcements are not going to come. Not yet. Let's rock. Scanning. All right, I'll 
Moving over here. Bit of a reload. No more enemies are left. And I uh, find it tragic that the last enemy in his last turn essentially dealt some damage to one of our soldiers. Elsewise, that would have been a flawless mission. I'm a bit disappointed. On the other hand, what I really liked was the overall performance of the team. Pretty much the standoff performance of everyone involved. Status confirmed. We have control of the network tower. The signal is going out. Operation Hammer Queen was a success and we crushed it. My personal favorite moment was the Blade Storm kill zone dual kill. That was just hilarious. And there we are. We even got a promotion out of it. Zirkin. Holy shit. Finally, Master Sergeant. So we got Rupture. Rupture is great. Specifically for bigger targets. It's probably nothing better than 4 aim, 1 mobility, 2 hit points, 4 will and 4 dodge. It's just too good. Combs fitness is great. I mean, Rupture is good, don't get me wrong, for bigger enemies, but at the same time, Combat fitness, too good. Too good. And we got a few items. Which is fine. Um, nice, we got a bond upgrade theoretically available. Since they were on missions together. And if I'm not mistaken, we should get exactly that uh, the location of uh, the enemy headquarters. Squad size maximum 10. And we are definitely going to infiltrate it. Just in a second, we need to do another um, Advent Tower. And we'll need to get some more funds. I'm not sure about the Avatar project and the um, headquarters. I imagine that that should reduce uh, the Avatar project. Last time that we've liberated, or the first liberation that we had, we didn't know about the Avatar pro uh, progress yet. Uh, enemy deploys units who can do extra damage with their primary weapon. Oh shit. They got center mass as an upgrade. Bond training completed on level 2. Well, that is great. question that I'm asking myself is... If we were, I mean, we can't just let Ed Gale and Poe and, and Jordan do the bond training now. That's 10 days and we need them for the infiltration of the facility. So we're going to let a couple of others get their bond training first. Higher bonds offer better abilities, so we definitely should use them. But it's not like the it's not that the abilities are completely game breaking, so we should not uh, deprioritize everything else. There we go. There is the two hundred percent, and we got another specialist. So we're going to do the next mission, but before we do that, let's take a look at our armory. And what else do we need? If we look at the rookies...
Specialist Assault, Sharpshooter, Shinobi, and, and Sparks looks about okay. Probably can use. So, Assaults. We only have five. One, two, three, four, five, six Grenadiers. That's fine. We're already in the uh, training of a gunner. One, two, three, four, five Rangers. That's fine. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sharpshooters, which is good. Shinobis, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's good as well. Specialists, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is fine as well. One, two, three technicians. So we uh, we have enough cover removal. We definitely don't need more. We got plenty. I think another sniper and another uh, specialist definitely wouldn't hurt. And probably another shinobi. Assaults are fine as well. Uh, oh, wait, let's take a look what the abilities of uh, the new rookies are. So we got someone with 70 aim here. That might be another sniper, Jesus. Low aim, 17 mobility. That almost asks uh, for... Um, uh, uh, for a scout, uh, for Shinobi. And this year, moderate hacking uh, abilities, yeah, that could be another, Ahmed could be another uh, specialist. So the question is, what do we need first? I would say we're going for the specialist first in Ahmed and then the other two afterwards. Thing with the specialists is even if you just let them sit idle, you will eventually find the mission where you need one. So the classes that I want to have on almost every single mission, because uh, they uh, don't have an equivalent, um, would probably be... Oh, we're at the end of the video anyways, but since you have stuck until the end of the video, might as well get a bit of a knowledge bomb there. Um, so the classes that I personally stick with, because they are kind of essential for a round team comp combination, which I usually try to do, um, because it just has so much more flexibility. So the ones that don't have a counterpart is A, the sniper. The sniper has the ability of basically choosing one of the targets and and uh, supporting a flank that otherwise can't be supported by movements. The great ability of that, in my perspective, is even uh, the Shinobi or the Assault, which could do a similar uh, thing by just rushing in, uh, run the risk of essentially pulling another pack, whilst the Sniper never does that. And if you have a good enough Sniper, um, you can like dish out damage on one target somewhere on the map. Uh, if you play your cards right. So that's why I like the class. It's not a great stackable class, so I wouldn't like go into a mission and have more than two snipers. I personally don't think that that's a really good way of playing. Um, there is a famous build in, uh, in uh, the forums that's being discussed where you essentially have like one mech that is all the way up front, um, completely shielded uh, with uh, two um, uh, with two engineers, uh, so with two specialists, uh, chain shielding it with um, uh, with uh, eight protocol, and then from time to time uh, a support um, uh, dense smoke, 
on top of it so that with its own defense that the two hit chance is probably minus 60 or minus 80 so that most of the blows are glancing blows and then you essentially just have uh, have it repaired plus it has huge self-repairing capabilities and you stack like two or three snipers um, into that squad and you're you're essentially um, kind of slowly wearing down the enemy um, I know that that was a common tactic for uh, for uh, the supply raids where you could put that in front of 20 enemies and they were just shooting at it can't mind control it can't really um, uh, crowd control it either and just were uh, essentially fucked up over time and uh, with gunners um, uh, kind of keeping uh, certain spots with area suppression with the same methodology you could build up a quite uh, defensively uh, playing team i personally think that that is a very niche uh, situation and once uh, one of the dominoes in your team begins to fall everything else falls in place and that's really the best thing about uh, the team is um, uh, a good team is versatility so that you can react to situations so the number one class back to the original topic would be probably the um, the sniper that I would want to have in every single um, in every single team, some shape or form. And the number two class, um, uh, not in that order, but just going through it mentally, the number two class would be the specialist, uh, and the specialist fulfills essentially the role of enabling healing um, and revival protocoling so it gives um, an uh, another class extra uh, turns activates uh, them and removes debuff from the enemies uh, which is absolutely essential because you will inevitably run into situations where you are going to be in some shape or form disabled and if you can counteract these there are some abilities which just don't have any real good counterplay uh, shadow melt as one of them from the specter is easily counterplayed uh, with a specialist but if you don't have a specialist and don't have revival protocol uh, you're all of a sudden sitting there maybe with a small team of four um, operatives one of your operatives usually the one in the front line um, is just being taken down and now you have to deal with that huge monster of a shadow um, a creature mainly sh shooting all of your abilities into it just to free up your original um, soldiers so that just is really bad and i think that the specialists offer a nice option it also counterplays the good old stun lances where there is no counterplay once you're unconscious unless you do have revival protocol um so long story short that's why i would always go with them um, i never understood the argumentation that you should uh, play an aggressive uh, specialist here's the deal you can have an aggressive specialist focusing on hacking as an addition it is such a great class that you can just have that as an addition on top of a normal specialist and there's nothing wrong with that it is a good soldier with just great abilities to hack but the healing abilities or you need to have one of the soldiers in there unless you're reckless and you don't care about losing soldiers in which case all power to you you can play the game however you want but that is that would be my uh, take on it so those two classes uh, therefore they don't have really an uh, an another uh, class that does uh, uh, their niche in the same quality uh, that they are currently doing it then you do have the cover removal classes they are really interchangeable um, i read a lot of guides up front and at the beginning of this run i even said um, yeah the uh, the grenadiers are better in end game and so on and so forth out of my experience yes they were a little bit better but now looking at uh, how the technicians have really performed in this run i really don't see any uh, huge uh, differences the grenadiers do have more um, more grenades overall but cover removal is just such a small part because it is extremely hard to do first and foremost and secondly you are ending up eventually uh, doing other uh, stuff as well and it's not just 
plain removal of cover and that's about it. So those are pretty interchangeable. Uh, you definitely want to have one of them in your team, maybe even two, but uh, they are they are good and necessary, but you don't need uh, like 10, uh, 10 of uh, them. So uh, having one once in a while is good. And by thinking about it, I might make one of uh, the um, one of the next rookies uh, also a technician. Uh, we do have a lot of grenadiers, and another technician wouldn't be wrong. Uh, I wanted to try out the uh, flamethrower route, anyways. So the, these two classes, I would really lump them together, and then there are a lot of the classes which. Uh, which fall into the kind of midfield, uh, Ranger and uh, Gunner, both of them, in my perspective, interchangeable. You can now argue lengthy about area suppression. Yeah, it's good and cool. I like it. On the other hand, the Ranger has um, the ability to just dish out more damage and shoot more often. At the end of the day, both of them kill shit and are uh, there to be your DPS. Uh, if if they are enabled, uh, both of them deal really good damage and do what they are supposed to do, which is killing stuff. And then you do have the frontline characters, mainly um, the Shinobi and uh, the Assault. I like the Shinobi because they have upgraded the melee damage quite a bit and uh, as time uh, grows I learn to appreciate them more. Um, it's definitely less of a scouting class originally in Long War. They always used to be kind of a, a scouting class with their little SMG running around with low detection radius. Um, in here, in all reality, most of the missions that I'm doing, um, I am kind of forced to to uh, to let them be discovered sooner or later. Maybe later when you do have all of the upgrades where you uh, can always infiltrate with eight people and that's kind of your standard go-to um, size. Maybe then leaving them as a scout is okay, but I see a massive difference between them and the Reaper. The Reaper is how the class should have been made in the first place. The Shinobi is how it was uh, implemented and the Shinobi is essentially just a melee uh, combatant. Don't get me wrong, they are doing that super well and like I said, they can reach places that you normally can't reach super hard uh, to get into f uh, full cover and they deal a shit ton of damage, so that's great. But you gotta uh, live with a backlash of uh, potentially pulling additional packs and so on and so forth. Um, if you play it well, great. If not, not so great. Um, and the assault is pretty much the same. So that's how I am looking at the roster. And when I'm overall looking at the roster, my thought process is um, always how would I then um, kind of staff such a team? And I'm counting the assaults five plus kind of the shinobis. Uh, that's another five, so that's ten. You don't necessarily need to have a shinobi and an assault. Um, so it's okay if you had 10 rosters you could go with that you know, i also have a reaper on top of it then you do have seven uh six or seven grenadiers and three technicians that's okay as well i don't mind that and uh, then i'm going through the infantry seeing yeah you know what three gunners and five rangers might be a little bit low on uh, on uh, that side Probably even two gunners are fine to uh, kind of uh, up that a little bit. I found the gunners more effective than I was initially thinking. I mean, they are okay. Um, I like the rangers as well. They are okay. It's a, it's a good class. Nothing to complain about. Um, the sparks would probably fall into the same uh, category. That's why uh, uh, these uh, here plus the sparks are pretty much the normal damage dealer midfield. Then there is the sharpshooter and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We probably want to have an eighth and a ninth uh, sharpshooter uh, just to kind of outfit nine squ uh, swats at the end of the day one two three four five six seven specialists same deal you want to have probably over the longer term um, one or two more specialists so 
that's the logic behind it. I hope you found it uh, helpful. Uh, it's uh, me talking 10 minutes about theory of, um, of uh, uh, yeah, group building in XCOM 2. And we're already over an hour again. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you found value in this video, leave a comment and a like down below. Maybe you can share with me what your favorite uh, class is. Um, and if you agree with the statements that I've just made. Elsewise, just post a, uh, post a thumbs up and that's cool as well. Thanks and see you in the next run. Bye-bye.